Hello, Coventry. I'm Lee Strobel. I wish so much I could be with you, but uh, I'm here in my home in Houston, Texas, and so glad to be able to share with you uh, today a true story. Uh, it's my story, and it's a story that began in atheism, because I decided at you know, a rather young age that God does not and cannot exist. Now, I just thought the mere concept of an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe? Come on, it's crazy. It wasn't even worth my time to check out. Now, granted, I tend to be a skeptical person. My background's in journalism and law, so you can imagine, put those two things together, what kind of a jerk that, or skeptic, what kind of a skeptic that you get. Uh, I was legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, and we used to pride ourselves on our skepticism. We didn't accept anybody's word at face value. We always tried to get at least two sources to confirm a fact before we print it in the newspaper. So no kidding, we had a sign in our newsroom that said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Maybe she's lying. Got any proof? Got anything to back that up? And that's okay for a journalist to be skeptical, right? I mean, sometimes I wish they were more skeptical than they are. But here's my problem. My skepticism bubbled over into cynicism and it cemented me into my atheism. Now, because I had no belief in God, I, I really lacked a moral framework for my life. And I'm not saying all atheists are like this. I'm just saying this is the way I looked at the world. I tend to be logical. I tend to be rational. So I said, okay, uh, if there is no God, if there is no heaven, if there is no hell, if there is no judgment, if there is no ultimate accountability, then the most logical way for me to live my life would be as a hedonist, someone who just pursued pleasure. And that's what I did. And so I lived a very immoral and drunken and profane and narcissistic, self-absorbed, really in a lot of ways self-destructive kind of a life. That was my life. What people saw was my success. What they saw was me graduating from Yale Law School. What they saw was me winning awards for investigative reporting. But they didn't see the other side, which was me literally drunk in the snow in an alley you know, on Saturday night. I had so much rage inside of me, so much anger. And if you asked me back then, hey, what's the deal? Why the anger? I couldn't have told you. But looking back, I know what it was. I was always after the perfect high. You know, I, I was always after that ultimate experience of pleasure. But guess what? Everything let me down. Nothing lived up to the hype. So I had a rage inside. I remember once and my wife Leslie and I got in an argument and our little daughter was there and, and, and I had so much rage I just blew up and I, and I reared back and I kicked a hole right through our living room wall. And my wife's crying and my daughter's crying. It was like, hey, and it was just another day in the Strobel house. In fact, I'm going to tell you the ugliest thing about me, which is that when I was um, a journalist, a drunk, if my daughter, who was a toddler at the time, was alone in the living room playing with some blocks, some toys or whatever, and she would hear me come home from work through the front door, her natural reaction was just to gather her toys and go in her room and shut the door. Is he going to be drunk again? Is he going to be yelling and screaming and, you know, kicking holes in walls? You know what? At least it's nice and quiet in here. Friends, that is the ugliest truth about me. My wife, Leslie, was agnostic. She didn't know what to think about God. And uh, so one day, through some various circumstances, she met a woman who was a Christian, who was a nurse, and they became best friends. And it was very natural for this woman, Linda, to share Jesus with my wife, Leslie. And Leslie wasn't hostile toward this stuff. Nobody had ever told her this stuff before. So she asked questions, she went to church with her, she checks it out, and, and then one day she comes up to me and she gives me the worst news that an atheist could possibly get. She said, Lee, I've decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And I thought, oh no, you know, here it comes. She's going to turn into some holy roller or something. I didn't know. All I knew was I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. This wasn't part of the deal. 
Literally, the first word that went through my mind was divorce. I was going to walk out. In fact, this is embarrassing to say, but um, she had just planted a beautiful flower bed outside. And I had to go cut the lawn. And I went out, and in my anger, I just mowed down all of these flowers that she had just put. I was just so angry that this had come into our life. And um, so for a while, I began to see positive changes in her character and in her values. And uh, it was winsome and attractive, and it kind of pulled me toward faith. Um, but the other side of it was, I thought, I want the old Leslie back. You know, I married the one Leslie, the fun-filled Leslie, the adventuresome Leslie. Now, I don't know what she's going to turn into, uh, some sexually repressed prude or something. I didn't know. So I thought, how could I rescue her from this cult that she's gotten involved in? And so I looked at it as someone trained in journalism and law, and, and I realized that there was an Achilles heel to Christianity. There was a big flaw that I could exploit. And that flaw is this. Christians believe that Jesus died and then returned from the dead. <laughs> I was a journalist. I'd seen plenty of dead bodies. I'd never seen any of them come back from the dead. So I thought, it can't be hard for me to disprove the resurrection of Jesus. Honestly, I thought I could do it in a weekend. Give me a weekend, maybe a three-day weekend, but give me a weekend. I could certainly disprove this. And so I launched into an investigation using my journalism and my legal background to try to get to the truth of Christianity. And I'll be honest with you, I did approach it as quote-unquote objectively as I could. So in other words, my hope was I was going to discover that it was a lie, that it was a legend, that it was make-believe, that it was a mythology, and I could disprove it and rescue legend. That was my hope. But I was trained in journalism, in the old school of journalism. And in the old school of journalism, you tried to be objective. Uh, in baseball terms, you tried to call a ball a ball, a strike a strike. In other words, you wanted to be an umpire. You wanted to evaluate the evidence honestly. And so that's what I sought to do. And so I began to pursue the evidence. And there were four things in particular that captured my fascination and began to draw me in the opposite direction. The first was the evidence that Jesus was dead. You know, I mean, I thought maybe he survived the crucifixion and the cool, damp air of the tomb sort of resuscitated him. So you don't have a miraculous resurrection. You just have a fortuitous resuscitation. That's what I thought. But then I look and what did I find? That there is no evidence anywhere of anyone ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. That even the Journal of the American Medical Association carried an article analyzing the data and concluded, quote, clearly the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Um, and, and I looked and I realized not only do we have multiple accounts of the death of Jesus in the texts of the New Testament, there are five ancient sources outside the Bible confirming and corroborating his death. So I had to conclude, okay, Jesus was dead. Even the atheist scholar, Gerd Ludeman says it's indisputable that Jesus was dead. The second thing I looked at was the early accounts of the resurrection. Because I thought going into it, the resurrection was a legend. And I knew it took time for legend to develop in the ancient world. So I figured 100, 150, 200 years after the life of Jesus, stories were invented. Legends were manufactured, and that's where the idea of the resurrection came from. But what I learned decimates that claim. Because what I discovered is the best earliest evidence we have for the resurrection we find in 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3, this ancient creed of the church that says Jesus died. Why? For our sins. He was buried. And the third day he rose from the dead. And then it mentions the specific names of eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses to whom he appeared. Well, as I learned, that creed has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus, far too early to have been a pure legend. In fact, James D.G. Dunn, the great scholar in this area, says this tradition, this creed, 
we can be entirely certain was, was, was um, originated within months of the death of Jesus, was formulated within months of the death of Jesus. That's far too quick to write it off as a legend. Third thing was the empty tomb. And what convinced me of that was there was all this evidence involving the empty tomb, but then I realized even the opponents of Jesus conceded the tomb was empty. Because when, when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the, you know, what the opponents said was, oh, well, the disciples stole the body. Well, they're conceding the tomb is empty. They're just trying to explain how it got empty. So everybody's claiming the tomb was empty. And then finally, the fourth area is eyewitnesses. And what I learned is that we have at least nine accounts in ancient history, inside and outside the New Testament, confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. That is an avalanche of historical data. Um, you know, we have um, Paul's testimony about the apostles, that, that they're saying the same thing, that Jesus was resurrected. We have this creed that dates back too early to be a legend. We have um, Peter in the book of Acts um, saying this Jesus God raised from the dead, to which we're all witnesses. Um, we have the four gospels, which I believe are credible in their reports. And then outside the Bible, we have uh, Clement, who was personally ordained by Peter. And so he knew the some of the apostles, including Peter. And he writes a letter in the first century to the church in Corinth where he says that the disciples have uh, certainty about their convictions about Jesus being the Son of God because of the resurrection. Uh, and then we have Polycarp, who was ordained by John himself. He knew some of the, some of the disciples. And he writes a letter right after the turn of the century to the church in Philippi. And he has no less than five references to the resurrection. And he says, you know, uh, this is the basis for the conviction of the disciples that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Well, that is a raft of historical data. Um, nine ancient sources pointing uh, uh, to the truth that Jesus had resurrected. So I spent a year and nine months investigating this. And I looked at the minutia around the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. And it all came down to a Sunday. And Leslie brought me to church that day. And honestly, I can't remember a word <laughs> that was said. But I went home and I, I went into my room and I realized um, a good juror reaches a verdict. The evidence was in after two years. It was time to reach a verdict. And so I kind of reviewed all of the data that I had collected over these two years, all of the evidence, and I kind of did a quick little review of it. And then I stepped back and I said, wait a second. In light of the avalanche of evidence that points so powerfully toward the truth of Christianity, I realized it would take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a Christian. In other words, the scales went like that. They just shifted under the weight of the evidence. And I realized that based on the historical data, I was convinced that Jesus didn't just claim to be the Son of God, but he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. But then I didn't know what to do. Because I, honestly, <laughs> it sounds a little weird, but I felt kind of let down at the moment. Because I spent two years of my life doing this, and it's like, okay, I've reached my conclusion. Is that it? Am I done? What do I do? Walk away? Um, but then Leslie pointed out a verse to me, John 1, 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I realized that verse forms an equation of what it means to become a child of God. Believe plus receive equals become. So I said, okay, I get it now. I believe based on the historical data that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. He backed it up by returning from the dead. I believe it based on the evidence. But then I realized that's not enough. I had to receive. Receive what? Receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. 
And when I would receive this free gift of his grace in a prayer of repentance and faith, then I would become a child of God. So I got on my knees and I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and I became a child of God. And Leslie burst into tears, and she threw her arms around my neck, and she said, I almost gave up on you a thousand times. She said, I remember when I was a new Christian, I met some women at church, and I told them about you. And I said, I don't have any hope for my husband. He is the hard-headed, hard-hearted legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He will never bend his knee to Jesus. And this one elderly saint, her name was Sylvia Sherry, put her arm around Leslie's shoulder and pulled her to the side and said, oh, Leslie, no one is beyond hope. And she gave her a verse in the Old Testament, Ezekiel 36, 26 that says, moreover, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And what I never knew, that whole two years that I'm on this investigative journey, what I never knew at the time is every day, on her own, in private, on her knees, my wife was praying that verse for me. She was praying, oh God, Lee's heart is like granite. I can't crack it open. You're going to have to do it. You're going to have to do it. And can I tell you what happened? God, starting on that Sunday afternoon when I put my trust in Christ, God started to answer her prayers because my values changed over time and my character and my morality and my attitudes and my relationships and my priorities and my parenting and my marriage. I mean, all these aspects of my life over time began to change for the good. So much so that our, our little daughter, Allison, um, she was five years old when I came to faith. Think about this. Five years old, all she knew her whole life up to that moment was a dad who was absent, angry, kicking holes in walls, coming home drunk. That was her whole life experience for those first five years. But starting on that Sunday afternoon, you know what she did? She started to watch. Something's changing with my dad. Something's different with my dad. Something's new with my dad. Never interviewed a scholar, never studied ancient history. She's just five years old, but she could watch, she could observe, and she did. And it took about four or five months. And then one Sunday morning, she came up first to her Sunday school teacher and then up to Leslie. And you know what she said? I want God to do for me what he's done for daddy. And at age five, my little girl received this free gift of God's grace, became a child of God. Today, she's married to a seminary graduate. She's a novelist. She writes books of fiction, but they all have the gospel of Jesus woven into them. Her and her husband write children's books about God. She is the mother of two of my four precious grandchildren. And today, we're the best of friends. And same thing with my son. My son saw the difference at a young age that God was having in his mom and his dad and his sister. And he came to faith as a youngster as well. And, and he took a different route. He took an academic route. Got an undergraduate degree in biblical studies. Then he got a master's degree in philosophy of religion. Then he got another master's degree in New Testament. And then after many years of research and study at Yale University and at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, he was awarded his PhD in theology. And you know what he does today? He's a professor of theology in one of the largest Christian seminaries in America, teaching future pastors about Jesus Christ. And six years ago, his wife gave birth to our first grandson, and he named him after his dad. Friends, God healed our family. God rescued our family. He changed my son, he changed my daughter, he changed my wife, he changed me, and now Leslie and I just celebrated our 46th wedding anniversary together. So that's my story, and, and now we see the grandchildren, one by one, coming to faith in Christ. 
Uh, this week, I'm going to be at the baptism of my 11-year-old granddaughter, Penelope. Um, and my Penelope and her sister, who's 13 years old, Abigail, you know what they do? On the weekends, they go down to the inner city of Houston, Texas, where the homeless people live. And they share Jesus with the homeless people there. And then one by one, they go up to the homeless men and women, and they take their hands in theirs, and they hold their hands, and they look them in the eye, and they say, how may I pray for you? These are my grandchildren. This is the legacy that God is creating in our family. And it all goes back to the fact that this is not a faith based on wishful thinking, legend, make-believe, mythology. It's a faith based on a solid foundation of historical truth. That's what led me to faith. And that's what God <laughs> is taking that and now changing the future generations of the Strobel family. God bless you all.